Mr. Minich. Thank you, John, um, both for that nice introduction and, and the invitation down here to Westmont. It's really a pleasure to, to be here. I'm a microbial geneticist by trade, and for about the last 15 years, I've worked on the bacterial flagellum, both from kind of the esoteric aspect of how an organism assembles an organelle, and also from the practical aspect in terms of using it as a diagnostic tool. One of the things that's impressed me um, is over the last 15 years is how our perception of the system has changed. And I've tried to encapsulate that here in, in, in my introductory slide. So we can use the bacterial flagellum as a paradigm for design. If you look at a bacterium, and here's the one that, that I work on, it's Yersinia intercalitica. It's first cousin to the organism that causes bubonic plague. It's a flagellated organism, 9 to 12 flagella, single-celled organism, not a whole lot to see, doesn't look that complex. This is the other um, model system, Salmonella, over here, again, with these flagella. These are the propeller that extend about 10 micrometers from the cell. Um, fairly simplistic organisms, but as we've dissected this process, both the biochemistry and the genetics, um, it's much more complex than I think was anticipated. And this structure here is a cross-section of the propeller. So if you look at this as a, you know, a spaghetti noodle and you just cut it right here and look at it from the end, this is a structure that we see. And it's even referred to it in the literature as, as being highly designed. And that's the point that I, that I want to make. In fact, I find it really interesting is I would call myself probably a third generation molecular biologist. Um, the guy, two of the guys that I worked with as a postdoc and graduate student uh, were, you know, students directly under Jacques Minot at the Pasteur and one worked with Crick in Cambridge. So they'd be second generation, I'd be third generation. And, and so the generation in front of me now is um, that really hit pay dirt in these areas of research are starting to write their memoirs. And there's a unifying theme, you know, Lucy Shapiro at Stanford, Rich Losick at Harvard, um, uh, Bruce Alberts, uh, who's the president of the National Academy, reflecting on what they've learned over their careers. And when they started out as graduate students in the, in the 1960s, um, they look at the cell as, as a bag of enzymes and things working on you know, second order kinetics. Fairly simplistic and to the point where Bruce Alberts wrote a review several years ago saying that we need to revamp the curriculum <laughs> in molecular biology and include a design engineering component because now we look at these systems in even the simplest organisms as molecular machines um, and very complex molecular machines and to understand how they're integrated and function as a unit, then you need really design engineering principles um, to understand exactly what's going on. And so we're, we need to include that in our curricula for the next generation of students. Along with this then comes the idea as we've dissected the complexity, can we still account for their arisal by the Darwinian paradigm of chance and necessity. And uh, so that's what I want to talk about today, using the bacterial flagellum as a, as a paradigm for design. And, and Mike Behe uses this in his book, Darwin's Black Box, which maybe some of you have read. Mike's a biochemist, and he approaches it from a biochemical standpoint. I'm a geneticist, and I think even with uh, more with geneticists, this idea of irreducible complexity resonates with us, because really it's our, our bread and butter in terms of how we understand these systems. So as an introduction then, um, I'll talk a little bit about design theory and irreducible complexity, give you an overview. I'm going to tell you in, about the bacterial flagellum, what we know about it, um, maybe in a little more detail than you want, uh, but the devil is in the details here, here. And look at how it's assembled from a genetic standpoint and biochemistry, 
some of the controls, the regulations, and that's involved in this process, and then how this motor, this molecular motor, is hardwired into a chemotaxis system or a sensory system that has really short-term memory. Um, and then if time permits, I want to talk a little bit about the research that we're doing on a component that's similar to the flagellum but has a different function. Okay, so design theory, irreducible complexity, maybe we could look at it as an old argument going back to Paley, even back to the, the Greeks that had these arguments between materialism and um, divine intervention. Um, but we're, we have to look at it now in light of our new understanding of these systems in biology. Irreducible complexity, which is Mike Behe's contribution, is simply this. You have macromolecular machines with interdependent components, all of which are required for function. And if you remove one of those components, then you lose that function. And therefore, there's really nothing to select. So you don't have a functional system until all the pieces are in place. Right? But if gradualism is to operate in biological systems from a Darwinian mode, you've got to have something to select in that process. And by definition, motility is dependent upon an operational motor. And in fact, if you lose one component, we found uh, that the other genes involved in the flagellum biosynthetic apparatus are targets for knockout mutations. They become sinks for um, transposons because those are going to be neutral selections on um, mutations on the organism and can be tolerated. Okay? Um, but again, all the components have to be there in place before you have something to, to select. Now, in terms of the flagellum, let me give you some of its operational parameters. Howard Berg, who works on the biophysics of flagellum, bacterial flagella, at Harvard, I've heard him speak several times at meetings and refers to the flagellum as the most efficient machine in the universe. And then he'll go through these parameters, that it self-assemblies and has repair mechanism. It's a water-cooled rotary engine. It's driven by proton motive force. It has two gears forward and reverse. Operates at 6,000 to 17,000 RPMs and can reverse direction within a quarter turn. So it's essentially a massless engine. We now have examples of bacteria that can spin their flagella at 100,000 RPMs. And this essentially can translate an organism at that speed, um, you know, 50 micrometers per second, which is a phenomenal speed if you were to scale that up to to um, our proportions. And this is pulling about 4,500 piconewtons per nanometer, which there's a lot of torque involved in, in the system. And it's hardwired to this signal transduction system with short-term memory, which I, which I mentioned. Okay, so we're, we're dealing with a true molecular machine. If we look at its composition, this is a, um, microphotograph from David Rosier's lab at Brandeis. And this is the, the motor itself. We call this the hook basal body complex. The propeller would be attached to this structure here and extend on the outer surface of the cell. So this is out of the cell going into the cellular cytoplasm. LMP rings are referred to as bushings like you would find in a true rotary engine. The hook is a universal joint Transversing from the cytoplasm through the inner membrane and the outer membrane is a drive shaft that rotates. The engine is housed here in this C-ring, M-ring complex, and this would be acting as a, as a stator. Okay, so we talk about the components of the flagellum analogously with true engines that we find that are, that are made by man. Same operational parameters. So here's a cartoon taken out of Voigt and Voigt as a cutaway picture showing that here's our hook um, universal joint. It rotates, the drive shaft rotates, and here's our rotary engine down here. And it's running on proton motive force. There's several models in terms of how this actually operates. We're really not quite sure at this point. 
but you essentially have a flow of, of um, protons through this system to, to energize it. It's not AT, ATP dependent. And here's the propeller that is comprised in most or organisms of a single protein that polymerizes in a helical structure. In fact, most of these structures are single proteins that have a helical nature. They're hollow. This system is hollow through the core. And not only is this an elegant engine to propel the cell, but it's an exquisite protein secretory mechanism because flagellar proteins are secreted in the order in which they're assembled from the inside of the cell outwards. So built into this system as well is some type of gatekeeper where only flagellar proteins are allowed through this hollow core. The flagellum actually grows from the tip, um, unlike the hairs in your head that are growing from the root. And so all of the subunits are exported through this hollow core and then assembled on the end. And it's within the last two months, in fact, there was a publication in Nature with a Japanese group that showed how that assembly process works. On the, on the end of the flagellum, there's essentially a cap protein that rotates and it functions much like a ratchet. So as you, as a component or flagellin um, protein unit comes through, it actually binds to this thing and gets assembled and polymerized to the growing filament chain through this ratchet process. So it's elegant. Um, and I'll talk, we call this now type 3 protein secretion. So it's a dedicated protein secretory mechanism. And one of the things that we're really interested in in my laboratory. Okay, so, you know, going back again, emphasizing from that picture of a single cell with these filaments hanging off of it, as we dissect um, the structure of this, of this organelle, it's, it's fairly complex. Okay, is it irreducibly complex? That is, is every component essential for its function? If you remove a single component, do you lose function? Well, to a geneticist, you bet. That's how we, in fact, that's how we know all the genes involved in flagellum biosynthesis because we've gone through this mutational process where we've selected for non-modal cells of E. coli or salmonella or Yersinia, and they're defined by this simple assay. This is a Petri dish. It's filled with a um, medium for the growth of the organism that has a dilute auger, uh, which is a solidifying agent, so the organisms can swim. So you can in inoculate organisms here, say, in the center of this point, and over the course of 16 hours, the organisms will chemotax or radiate out, and you get this um, frosted appearance of organelles as they've, of orga or the organism as it's spread out from that point inoculation. Now, if you've got a defective engine, you can't swim, and that would be typified by these two mutants here. They're dead in the water, they can grow in this media, but they can't swim or move from that inoculation. And then if we take the, identify the genes and put them back into that organism, we restore motility, oftentimes not to the wild type level due to uh, gene dosage effects, but we can show or precisely identify that a given gene is required for this aspect of motility and, and then determine what its role is in the whole process. So these are two mutations that we've identified in our lab for Yersinia. One is in a, a rod uh, gene we call FLGG, and this is in the hook or universal joint flag, flag E. Okay, So I'm just making a point. Every gene, and there are 50 genes involved that we know of in flagellum biosynthesis in these gram-negative bacteria, and they've all been identified on the basis of mutations. You need loss of function um, so that each gene is essential for the function of that organelle. Okay? So I would say, I'd up Mike Behe's argument. By definition, most of these systems that we study are irreducibly complex because if they weren't, we wouldn't know that much about them. Um, <coughs> okay. Now there's a blueprint in terms of how you assemble this system. It's assembled in a stepwise programmed manner that has checkpoints built into it. And if there is a 
is if, if there's a problem during the assembly, there's the feedback to shut down expression of genes that would normally be turned on later. Um, and that makes sense. You know, if you've got a train wreck or a pile up on the assembly line, you don't want to keep shuttling things down if you can, because these are expensive systems to run. About, you know, 50 genes, and these organisms that we're working with have about 4,000 genes total in their genome. Um, it's an investment, okay, in terms of 1% of maybe a little more of the genome, and it takes about 10% of the cell's energy to run these systems. 95% of the mass of these engines is in the propeller, the filament that's hanging out. And we find that that's highly controlled in terms of expression. So you build these things from the inner membrane outward. And, you know, all of these have been identified by mutations, and we can isolate these structures as intermediate components. I want to just give one example in terms of what for years was somewhat of a, an enigma to us is that you can have a mutation in any what we call a class two gene, which is involved in the basal body itself, all right, this hook structure with the, the engine. A mutation in any gene would knock out expression of the filament protein, which are, there are over 200,000 subunits per, per propeller, which makes sense. But how do you account for that? Is every gene, structural gene, acting as a regulatory gene and feeding back? Well, it turns out it's really an elegant solution to this problem. As this thing assembles, there's a protein we call FLAG-M. This is the work of Kelly Hughes at the University of Washington. FLAG-M is an, what we call an anti-sigma factor. It's an antagonist for the transcriptional activator required for expression of the filament proteins. So as this thing is being assembled, all these genes are turned on, including this FLAG-M antagonist protein, which builds up in the cytoplasm and keeps the filament proteins repressed transcriptionally. As soon as the hook is assembled, the first protein shunted out of the cell, actually secreted out of the cell, is FLAG-M. So you get rid of your negative regulator by simply titrating it or secreting it out of the cell, which then opens up you know, expression for the filament proteins, which you need a lot of. All right. If there's a mutation in this structure, then FLAG-M can't get out, and it keeps downstream genes, including flagellin, shut down. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a simple solution to what was a difficult problem for us to understand. And we find the same type of theme in other systems as well. Excellent way, you know, keep things shut off, and then when you're ready uh, for those genes to be expressed, you just secrete the negative regulator. Okay, in terms of the, of the um, rotary engine itself, we're just getting an idea of how this thing is functioning. This is a top-down picture of the housing that runs this rotary engine. There are a number of proteins involved. This is the MS ring, which is our, is our stator, and these proteins, fly M, fly M, fly G, have two conformations appear that they can shift. And the default state is counterclockwise, so the engine, the cell is propelled forward. Um, you can reverse it and stop an organism from running. The main thing I want to point out here is that if you look at this fly G protein here and the shaded, it's got to make contacts in three-dimensional space with fly F of the MS ring two contacts with fly N. We know from mutational um, allelic studies and also with mode A, mode B, the, the stator here. Okay, so you have a protein that's got to make four different contacts, any of which are disrupted, the system's trashed. All right, so that puts extraordinary constraints when a single amino acid can be off by several, several angstroms and the system no longer runs. Right. So um, again, these are things that we have to consider in terms of Darwinian thinking. Can chance and necessity uh, produce proteins with this specificity of interaction with multiple 
proteins, all of which are, are required. Again, if you remove FlyG, if you have a single amino acid mutation in any of these contact sites, the cells can't swim. All right? So <clears throat> now, I mentioned before that it's not enough for an organism to swim. It's got to have an idea where it's going because you can move in a favorable direction. You can move in an unfavorable direction as well. So this has got to be hardwired into some type of um, sensory system. And this has been a surprise as well. And the flagellum has paid off really an astonishing coin in terms of a model system for how cells respond to their environment or read their environment. This is a simple experiment that was done back in the 60s in Julius Adler's laboratory at the University of Wisconsin. And this is simply a, a microscope slide that's got a cover slip over it. And there's a suspension of E. coli or salmonella bacteria that have bis been suspended. And you've all seen this under a microscope before. What they did was insert underneath that cover slip a capillary tube that has some chemical, amino acid, carbohydrate, um, that the organism can utilize as a carbon source. And you find within 15 minutes that the organisms will actually pick up that signal and start migrating up this capillary tube. You can actually quantify this process because you can pull that tube out and then, you know, spread it out on a petri dish and count how many organisms uh, went up that tube, say with serine or alanine compared to distilled water. All right. Organisms can chemotax. And you can do the converse experiment if you put a repellent in there and find that the organisms will actually move away. What they're doing is they're sensing a gradient, a chemical gradient. And as they sense that gradient, they can tell when they're moving up the gradient or down the gradient and make the appropriate response. We call it a random walk in chemotaxis such that here uh, on this scale I've got concentration gradient low to high concentration of something this organism can use for a living. And so this is nirvana where they want to be and this is, you know, where they don't want to be or they want to get up here. And so what they do is they just start doing this random walk. This organism is moving with its engines going counterclockwise. It's sensing that it's going up the gradient a little bit and then it will clear the system and go through a reversal of the engines and now all the flagella are thrown out in a bundle and the organism will sit there and tumble. All right, so we call it run and tumble. And it will reorient itself randomly in its environment. You go counterclockwise again, all engines going counterclockwise, and now it's going up the gradient. So it's a long run, it can sense. It's got receptors on the nose of this organism that are picking up these molecules and transferring that information to the, to the engine saying, we're going the right direction, keep going, keep going, keep going until the point that it will clear those receptors, go into a tumble. If it goes in the, if it's now going back down the gradient, it recognizes that immediately and will stop. Okay, so again, this is a, a random walk. What's really interesting is that these organisms will, due to Brownian motion, get thrown off course. If they're moving, if their engines are running counterclockwise and they're going straight, Brownian motion will throw them off course about 60 degrees in four seconds. Okay, so the organism's faced with this, with this dilemma, um, like any statistician. To make the right decision, you want to sample, get as many samples as you can, right, before you make a decision. If you take too few samples from your environment, then you may be making an erroneous decision. If you take too many, in this case, by the time you make a decision, you're way off course and it's irrelevant. The half-life of the molecules involved in this signal transduction system are about four seconds, precisely fine-tuned to um, the parameters under which these organisms have to make decisions. Okay, I find that fascinating. And here's part of the part of the signal transduction system again to show you that this is not a, a simplistic system, and we find the same basic processes going on in higher organisms. You have some type of receptor. We call it a methyl accepting chemotaxis protein or MCP. This is our attractant. If this thing is occupied, 
then we get a phosphorylation reaction cascade of these proteins transferring you know, phos a phosphate group to different chemotaxis proteins that eventually make their way down here to the flagellum and either say continue in the default counterclockwise rotation or go clockwise. Okay? And again, these things are ha on an order of half-life of, of two to four seconds, precisely what's required for the system. All right, now I want to talk just a little bit about some of the stuff that, that we've been working on in the last few years. Um, and that's with this organism, Yersinia intercolitica. Right, that's a mouthful, I recognize. But Yersinia, within that gen genus, there are three human pathogens. Yersinia pestis, which causes bubonic plague, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and Yersinia intercolitica, both which cause gastroenteritis. And they've been model systems for gram-negative bacterial infections, partly because of this observation that temperature is a key environmental signal that these organisms can utilize and over a very narrow range. And it has a profound effect on the genetic expression or genetic programming of these cells. So our organism is modal actually at 30 degrees and if you shift it to 37 degrees Celsius, which is mammalian body temperature, they're non-modal. Other sets of genes that are turned off, that are shut down at ambient temperature would be those required for virulence, toxin genes um, that are anti-host factors. And we find that converse, that when we shift to 37 degrees, they're expressed as fast as we can measure them. Okay, we get transcription, and this is, appears to be transcription control. So the question we wanted to know was, how does temperature regulate gene expression? And we're going to use motility and virulence gene expression as our two phenotypes or handles to monitor this system. And is there a reason why motility is shut down in the host? Um, and this has been really an interesting project and a lot of... of um, unexpected results. In terms of defining the system, these organisms are very similar to E. coli and, and Salmonella. Um, genetically, we can take genes involved in flagellum biosynthesis from Yersinia and complement the same gene mutation in Salmonella or E. coli. They're interchangeable. Right? So that's a uh, nice handle. Disease in Yersinia is due to this plasmid primarily. Right? It's absolutely required this is a piece of DNA of about 70,000 base pairs that's um, extra chromosomal. It's not part of the chromosome of the organism. And all pathogenic species of Yersinia have this same basic um, plasmid, including the bubonic plague organism. This region here is about 30 genes is involved in building a structure we now know to secrete these what we call YOPs for Yersinia outer proteins. These are toxins. These are anti-host factors. Okay, so um, YOP Q, YOP O, um, some of these other ones around here, YOP M, are all essential for you know causing disease in the host. And to get to the host, they require all of these genes, which are in this VER B and VER C operon, to do that. Now, early on in about 1992. I had a friend that was working in, on um, flagellum biosynthesis in a different organism, and he wanted to know what YSC um, or LCRD did, which I'm not sure if it, we have the same gene on here. But it's, he's working in, he was working in an organism that has no economic or medical importance at all. Okay? And, and uh, so he wanted to know what this gene was involved with in our organism because when he sequenced the gene, and he's working on flagellum biosynthesis in Colobacter, when he sequenced this gene, did his blast search against the gene bank, it came up with a gene on this plasmid. And um, an essential gene for virulence. And over the next couple of years, we realized that many of these genes here, at least 10 of them, and there are about 30, have similarity in DNA sequence and predicted amino acid sequence to flagellar genes. 
Okay, so keep that in mind. That was a piece of the puzzle. Also, in terms of the switch, I'll just mention this as well. Um, what's the thermostat in our organism in terms of switching from you know 30 degrees to 37 degrees? We want to know what the thermostat was, right? How does the organism sense temperature and make a change? And we suspected there'd probably be a protein in the in the inner membrane that would change conformation over this narrow temperature. Turned out not to be the case. All the mutations that we got were pointing to DNA structure. We had a gyrase mutant. Um, There's a group in Belgium that got a histone-like protein mutation. And as it turns out, the sensor for this switch is DNA itself. And that these virulence genes that are shut off at low temperature are bracketed by regions of, of um, intrinsic DNA bends. And we have an assay here where we can take that virulence plasma, 70,000 base pairs, cut it up into discrete fragments, and we run it in a gel in the first dimension at, um, in this case, uh, 60 degrees, in the second dimension at 4 degrees, and we you form a diagonal, but if there's a bent piece of DNA, it falls off that diagonal and lags behind. So that's kind of how we define intrinsically bent DNA. And at 37 degrees, those bends melt. And we find the promoters of these virulence genes are bracketed by DNA bends. They keep them repressed. You hit 37 degrees, they melt out, you get a compensatory change in supercoiling, and, and they fire right away. So in retrospect, it's um, an exquisite trigger to keep genes shut off under one condition and express them immediately when you hit 37 degrees. What it told us, though, and this is where we had problems, because I have to convince the National Institute of Health, you know, or other granting agencies that this is a mechanism whereby this organism is functioning. And at the time, DNA is a reservoir for information. DNA itself has no role directly in terms of saying who gets expressed when. And this is saying that there's more than just information. There's a second level of information in DNA, that the conformation of DNA also is very important. And... Um, now this has been shown in a couple of other organisms as well. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, anticipated. And I think our, my students and I, finally, in terms of trying to figure out all the puzzles that we were running into, came up with this hypothesis of, of um, intrinsically dent DNA. It was the only one that would fit. And then, sure enough, we found it. Okay, so it was kind of a reverse engineering. And uh, I found it interesting. Our paper was reviewed in um, Trends in microbiology several years ago, and the, and the reviewer said, you know, isn't evolution wonderful? Isn't this a, isn't this a, a wonderful system? Um, but evolutionary theory didn't give us any insight in terms of, of how, to, how to go after that system. Okay. Now, what was interesting in terms, again, and we're looking at this switch. You've got a Flagella made at low temperature, they're shut off at high temperature. Virulence genes are off at low temperature, they're turned on at high temperature. We had mutations showing that this was a coordinate response. Okay, we, we could get mutations that were constitutive in virulence gene expression, making them anti-host factors all the time, and also non-modal, implying that there was some crosstalk between these two systems. And this is uh, actually out of a paper from a group in, in um, Sweden, where they showed, this is computer enhanced. This is Yersinia sitting on a macrophage, a white blood cell, and uh, with confocal microscopy, and it's being stained for a particular anti-host factor or toxin, and that's the red here. So this organism sits on the surface. Here we're looking at it from the side, and then as we cut away into the cytoplasm of the macrophage, we find that this toxin is being secreted directly into the macrophage, only from the side of the cell that's in contact with it. So that implied that, you know, these proteins are, are being directionally or polarized secreted into the system. And also at this time we knew that there were less, at least 10 proteins involved in this secretion process that were similar to flagellar proteins. All right, so we started thinking, okay, is there a correlation here? We usually think of the flagellum as a, you know, a rotary engine for propelling the cell. It's a highly efficient machine. 
but it's also, as I mentioned, an exquisite protein secretory apparatus. Um, could it be that the reason we lose motility at high temperature is because we reorganize the flagellar basal body to secrete not flagellar proteins, but toxins, okay? So we had this cartoon that we tried to convince people with that, that um, okay, here we are at 28 degrees or 30 degrees. We've got a flagellum. Everybody knows what that is. And at 37 degrees, we turn it into what we call a YOP cannon, okay? These are sitting the outer proteins. And we're using the basal body not to secrete filament protein, but these anti-host factors, and they are contact dependent. Oh. You know, I, I really got, you know, hit hard on that one night from friends and colleagues in my review for it in NIH saying this is a whimsical idea. There's no um, evidence that there's any relationship between a flagellum and virulence in these systems. And uh, why don't you work on something you know about? No. It's pretty embarrassing when you get those types of reviews back. But... I'm thinking from a design standpoint, and maybe this is the advantage that we have, and I think that is going to be important, is that I look at the bacterial flagellum as a machine. In fact, it's a composite machine. It's got not only, it's not only a rotor that has a propeller attached to it, but it's got a dedicated secretory mechanism associated with it for protein secretion, for selection of only certain proteins. So why not use it for something else? Right? The, the hallmark of a good machine, if you're, if you're an engineer, is you just don't make it for one single purpose. You, know, you can make money on the fact that you can adapt it to multiple uses. And you would think that the, an evolutionist would, would buy that as well. If they had a hard time with it. Well, as it turned out, we were wrong and we were right. Um, so the question then became, are these, you know, a single flagellar system that's doing double time, or are they separate systems, um, parallel systems. And so here's a structure of the basal body and flagellum, an EM, in a cartoon. And we started looking for these structures in 1994 based on our hypothesis. And I had a long conversation with Jorge Galan, who's at Yale University that works on this, what we call type 3 secretion for virulence proteins in salmonella. And I said, you guys, you've got all the mutants. You've got excellent electron microscopy facilities. You know, you should be looking for these structures. You're going to find them. They're going to be basal bodies, or even if they're separate parallel systems, whatever these secretory structures are for virulence are going to look like a basal body. Um, that's my hypothesis. And he found them within a year. Um, and this is what they look like. Okay, so we were wrong. There's separate systems in the chromosome, but they're very similar and these are the proteins in salmonella that are similar to the flagellar proteins we find in all gram-negative organisms. Um, just this last issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, Gunther Blobel, who I think won the Nobel Prize last year, and his student at Johns Hopkins or Rockefeller, wherever he is, uh, isolated the structures out of Yersinia. So none of us could do it until, until this last year. Okay. So we're the right idea, just the wrong organism. Um, this is what these structures look like in Yersinia, probably more than you want to know. But interestingly, you know, our hypothesis predicted that we'd be able to get mutations in a flagellar, in flagellar genes, non-modal, and they'd also be trashed for protein secretion. We, ha we got those mutants. It also predicted that Yersinia pestis, which is the plague organism, which is non-modal, has been since years and isolated at, at the turn of the last century should have flagellar genes, and some of them should be expressed. And that turns out to be the case. So we were kind of getting led down the um, garden path on this. Uh, and so we built these mutants. And we found out subsequently with collaborating with um, Virginia Miller that there are virulence proteins that actually do go out of the flagellum, not the YOPs that we were looking at originally. But the flagellum can be used for other than protein secretion. So we were wrong in a sense, but afterwards we're right. It was the right idea. And like I said, I think we came to that conclusion from a design perspective. Um, and also, we come back, I don't want to, I want to 
I've got one picture here. I don't want to bore you with the gels, but that's the proof of this picture here. And I can go over this with any of you if you're interested. So here's our Yersinia cell here, okay? So this is the cytoplasm. This is outside. This is a host cell. This is a macrophage. Pathogenic Yersinia are masters at evading your immune system. One of the hallmarks of Yersinia infections, bubonic plague, is lack of an inflammatory response. So if they make contact with a host cell, they build this structure that looks like the basal body of a flagellum, and they shoot in these little um, lightning bolts that knock out precise you know, aspects of the immune system within this, within this macrophage. So we have a flagellum at low temperature. This thing is turned on at 37 degrees. And so we ask, well, why? OK, we'll go back to this question. Why do we have to shut off motility in the host? Now, there's groups at Duke and, and um, several universities that have shown that the filament protein is a potent cytokine inducer. So these are activators of your immune response. So maybe it makes sense to keep flagellin shut off. These two systems are very similar in terms of their structure and function with respect to protein secretion. So we ask the question then, what if we take the gene for this filament, okay, clone it, and put it behind a promoter that we can artificially induce under different conditions? Okay, so this protein is shut off immediately when you hit 37 degrees. We just stick it behind the, you know, the, the lactose operon promoter, and we can turn it on at 37 degrees and ask, can it get out? Is it recognized by the type 3 system? Okay, this virulence one. And it is. In fact, we can get flagellin out of these systems um, when we turn them on. And they're dependent upon this virulence plasmid and specific genes in the system. And we can take a virulence protein that's only turned on at 37 degrees, and we can get it expressed at low temperatures. So the substrates for these systems, we've actually found another type 3 system um, that's on at low temperature that's under high salt condition expression. So under high sodium chloride or osmotic conditions, you shut off motility and you secrete these other proteins that are required for virulence. Under low osmotic conditions, ambient temperature, you're flagellated in the host. Under high temperature, low calcium, you secrete these virulence proteins. So you've got three dedicated secretory systems. They're all segregated by environmental signals. They're all similar in terms of their structure and they cross-recognize substrates, okay? So whatever the signal is for secretion is recognized by all of these systems. So it makes sense. You shift to 37 degrees, you've got to shut down filament expression of the flagellum. Otherwise, you're going to shoot it right into the cell, which is the last place you want to display that protein. And in fact, you can't, you can't um, well, the point being that if you're going to say that the type 3 system has evolved from the flagellum, it doesn't work because these things will all interfere with the function of each other, and that's very detrimental to the cell. All right, it's a point that I want to make, and I could address that later. But let me stop there. I've gone for about 45 minutes, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy. Well, let me stop with my summary slide. Let me pull everything together for you. Okay. As I said, it's probably more detail than many of you wanted. But just to reiterate, the bacterial flagellum is an elegant, efficient machine. And we, we use these words in the literature. All right? I'm not making this up. Uh, with all the elements of design and its intrinsic function, genetic regulation, and chromosomal organization, which I haven't mentioned, but that's another whole lecture in terms of just the genetic organization of these genes. It's just you just can't put them in the chromosome randomly um, and get function. The organelle is irreducibly complex in this very parameter that has made it amenable to molecular genetic dissection. So by definition, all of the genes involved in motility have a phenotypic expression based on mutational analysis. They're either chemotaxic deficient um, or they're non-modal. Okay. And of the thousands of papers written on this organelle, none address its mechanism of emergence or evolution. Okay. We don't have any intermediates. No one has postulated how this thing arose, and, um, and it's not out of ignorance. I mean, we, we, we know how this thing operates. 
And in fact, we have no mechanism to explain the evolution of such complex machines. So I would say intrinsic in this organelle is you know, design. And this isn't some God of the gaps type of, type of argument. In any other situation where you see rotors and stators and U-joints and drive shafts, you would infer a designer. Okay, it's the simplest explanation. Um, and I think it's going to be, the onus is now going to be upon Darwinian um, proponents to come up with the mechanisms whereby these things arose because uh, they, are, they are complex. They, let me end with this. Okay, with as much as we know about this system, there's nobody yet that could build one of these systems with all the intelligence, combined intelligence. Okay. We still can't make molecular motors that can operate under these conditions of 100,000 RPMs or whatever. Right. So you're going to have to operate on a little bit of faith then if you're going to say that these things um, can be solely the product of chance and necessity. With that, I'll, I'll end it. And happy to entertain any questions. Thanks for your attention. All right, just really, really quickly, thank you very much because uh, this is exactly what we've been talking about in class. And we, we had a, uh, a student lecturer uh, for an hour yesterday in class talk about irreducibly com complex organisms. And uh, he mentioned that the only other alternative would, would be that the, uh, the organism was, came, came about by an indirect means in that the, the, it was using the structures for other things, and then all of a sudden the structures started substituting um, their role for that for a bigger, a bigger idea. And I just wanted to know what you thought about um, a bacterial flagellum coming about through an indirect kind of evolution. Is that just as absurd as, as anything else? I think so. I mean, you can, you can hypothesize that. It's going to be difficult to, to work it out. And that, and that was you know, one of the things that was interesting about our system as it developed. You know, here's a flagellar-like structure, a subcomponent that's utilizing just the protein secretory nature. Now all the phylogenetic studies show that flagella came first and these type 3 secretory machines were subsequent. And um, so you're starting with a complex and maybe splitting off um, something else. But the other thing that's interesting too is, you know, what are the intermediates? I mean, we can't, we know that if we make mutations in one of these type 3 secretory systems, whether it be the flagellum, or you know this virulent system, we can trash both. Um, so you can't just add on or say, okay, now I want to secrete this protein because you're going to interfere potentially with the ability of the organism to cause disease or to you know, make a living out in the environment in terms of having motility as a necessary function. All of the type three secretory machines involved in virulence also come in discrete packets, you know, of 30 genes or more. We can actually identify them in the chromosomes based on G plus C concentration. We talk about them as islands of pathogenicity. So why is it that we see all these systems bundled? I mean, it's like Microsoft. You just don't get word. You've got to buy the whole office system and, um, you know, when you, when you get it. And, and you wouldn't predict that from a, from a gradual um, scenario. I'm saying that we know that flagellin proteins. Yeah. Okay. So then, does the flagellum induce an immune response? That was right. It, it it makes rational sense why you shut off motility. Um, for two reasons. One, the organism doesn't want to display this protein because it's a potent cytokine inducer. Okay. So you're going to you know, activate the cells that you want to try to evade. And also, because flagellin can be secreted by the same port you know, mm -hmm. as these virulence proteins, you can get jamming flagellins because you're making 200,000 know, <coughs> subunits per filament. 
we know in Bordetella studies at you know Jeff Miller's lab here at UCLA that that if you express flagellin protein, you're avirulent, probably because you're jamming you know, or, or titrating out the ability of the organism to secrete anti-host factors. So, so it's dual. Yeah. So how do you think that the that the bacteria knows that? I mean, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, do you know? I mean. Those are tough questions. I mean, you, you've got to, that's where you bring in your, your philosophy. But you know, have, they just, have they, I mean, how can you really even test that too? Like what kind of? You can't. But when you look yeah. back and you use reverse engineering, it's intuitively obvious after the fact. That's the point that I'm trying to make, is that evolution doesn't tell me what experiments to, to run, mm -hmm. to dissect a system. I'm doing reverse engineering. I'm busting it. I don't have the blue points. I'm, you know getting specific mutations, and then trying to reassemble and see how these parts interact. You know? So when we, when we invoke Darwinian thinking, it's always after the fact. You know? it's not, it's not, it doesn't give us any predictive power, if that makes sense. So, yeah. so in answer to your question, no, you can't really ask those questions. You know? We don't know why. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other? Other question. But it does bring up, you know, I mean, if we're going, if we're going to take on design, these type three systems are designed, you know, then by definition, and and it's malevolence, you know, that we're looking at. You know, um, these things are designed to kill us, or at least harm us. So that gets into some really interesting metaphysical questions. Question over here. Yeah, I had one question. It seemed fairly obvious um, that you are asserting that the Darwinian mechanism is rather inadequate to explain bacteria flagellum in, in that it, as an organelle. <laughs> um, however, I'm wondering, um, though we could make the design inference, if you would be equally open to um, another paradigm, perhaps materialistic in nature, that would be able to explain it. Um, I, I'm thinking of another scientific discovery or even theory that maybe we don't have as of yet, um, but just because Darwinianism is inadequate, maybe not just jumping to d design automatically from it. That's a good question, you know, and that's, and that's brought up. My, my defense would be, again, you know, in any other situation where we see, you know, these components, we define it as an engine, we have no problem in inferring a designer. Okay? It doesn't say who the designer is. Darwinian theory is based on chance and necessity. And you see this appeal being made. Stuart Kaufman at the Santa Fe Institute is proposing there's a fourth law of thermodynamics to account for necessity because we don't have the driving force to assemble these things. Um, I find that interesting. You know, it's almost an admission of defeat on that side of, of, of necessity, that we can explain complex specified information from a Darwinian standpoint. And then when you look at chance, all right, um, we know we can date the universe. We know when the first fossils, bacterial system, you know, are found at 3.8 billion years or whatever. We've got a very narrow window in which those organisms had to evolve, so we have to invoke panspermia, or even a multiple universe scenario to expand our probabilistic resources to get this stuff to happen. So in answer to your point, yeah. You're essentially calling for, you know, um, a God of the gaps argument. Well, we don't know yet, but we'll find it. Um, evolution did it, which is the accusation that's always been leveled at us. You know, you just say God did it. Well, that ends science right there. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I think so. I, I guess I, I can't really argue for something because I don't think that there is anything as of yet that would be a materialistic theory that could explain what we've looked at thus far. However, I'm we wary of asserting that it's design um, simply based on the fact that the current paradigm doesn't work. Okay. So you're going to be conservative and, and wait for that to come up. Mm -hmm. right. That's fine. That's good. But the point being that we should be debating this, right? Uh, I find it really ironic that it's, you know, in the Christian colleges and schools that this debate is even being considered. You know, that you're, you know, you're told in secular schools that 
nothing in biology makes sense outside of evolution. You know, and I'm saying I don't use it. I've never taken a course in evolution. I was never required to. Um, we never had time to. because we're, we're in the business of reverse engineering. Okay. We always put the spin after the fact. Um, so it's not good in terms of predicting what experiments to do, or it's good in explaining afterwards, maybe putting a... I've, I've got a follow-up question, and I also have the microphone, so I can come back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Along the, along the same line of, line of thinking, is there evidence that the flagellum evolved at all? And if so, then perhaps we can look for a mechanism. But if there's evidence that it's stable, that that motor has existed as, as long as we have evidence for, then what I see is perhaps we've got evidence for a mechanism that prevents evolutionary change from occurring. And you seem to be inferring that natural selection would produce this stability and, and stasis. So the purpose of science would really be to explain, not origins, the origin of the motor, but would be to explain the function as, as, as you've done and why it does not evolve rather than why it does. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there are, there are variations on the theme. The model for flagellum biosynthesis are the gram-negative enteric organisms, E. coli, um, salmonella, colobacter, crescentis. Gram-positive organisms have flagella. So these are different in terms of their outer surface makeup. They don't have an outer membrane, and so they're missing a ring structure. So they're a little bit different, but although they're operating on the same principle, we can pick up flagellar genes based on similarity and structure. What it, I'd like to look into, and I haven't had the time, is what are archaeal, you know, the archaea look like in terms of their flagella. And I think that it's coming out that they're a little bit, a little bit different, and and maybe that's going to provide us. You know, I mean, I have no problem with microevolution, um, you know, adaptation. You're going to see structures adapting to different types of requirements. There are some flagellar motors that don't run on a proton motor force, but on a sodium ion um, current. Marine organisms are those that live under, you know, in high salt environments. So there's a switch in terms of how the motors are being driven. And we're just starting to get, you know, an idea of some of the diversity on those systems.